respected principal var lakshmi madam principal of central goda college faculty head of department of economics other faculty members and my dear friends it is always exciting to address uh, young students well i really do not know uh, how much you have read about the budget so let me tell you the budget need not be the concern of economics and commerce students but the due to lack of space here perhaps the, the college has confined to these two departments but budget concerns every one of us first let me begin with the basics especially because you are still students what is the budget well budget is an annual statement of expenditure and revenue how much you earn how much you spend where do you earn and where do you spend well there is a budget in the family your parents plan how much your parents earn and how much they spend where do they earn and where do they spend so the quality of expenditure and the source of revenue constitute the quality of the budget suppose your parents earn 25 30000 per month if they are spending 10000 of it on luxuries that is a bad expenditure but if they spend 20000 on the children's education and health of the family it's a good budget so the quality of budget is defined by the manner in which the money is spent of course it is also decided by the type of the 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 source of that money where is it coming from so a family has a budget a company has a budget a college has a budget an institution has a budget so similarly a nation a state has a budget too so the union budget is normally presented on february 1st it used to be presented on february 28 in the past why should the budget be presented so the constitution mandate says government of the day cannot spend even a single pie from april 1st the financial year in our country begins on april 1st of every year and ends on the march 31st of the next year so the financial year for 2023 24 begins on april 1st 2023 and comes to an end on march 31st 2024 so the budget is an annual statement of anticipated income for the government of india during this financial year and the plan of expenditure how does it intend to spend this money when when i say the government of india is not a small organization for example this year's budget the total expenditure is over 45 lakh crore you have seen the telangana budget yesterday it has come in today's newspaper the telangana state budget itself a comfort to lakh 90000 crores over 2 lakh 90000 crores so the country as a whole the budget is around 45000 45 lakh crores how does the government intend to earn this 45 lakh crores and how does the government intend to spend this 45 lakh crore and what is the outcome and impact of this expenditure and this income patterns can constitute the essence of a budget according to the constitution of india the executive we have three organs in the constitution executive legislature and judiciary the executive proposes the budget to the legislature if it is at the central level you have the union finance minister on behalf of the union cabinet presents the budget to the parliament and in the state the state finance minister presents the budget to the state legislature and the budget is debated discussed and approved so unless this budget is approved by the parliament 
the government of india cannot spend anything from april 1 so it's a constitutional mandate in case the budget the full budget is not to be not presented for some reason assuming that next year perhaps the full budget will not be presented because the elections will be in may 2024 and in february the government of india presents the budget assuming that the new government comes in may this political party that rules the country lost loses the elections and some other party comes so the budget will change so normally during elections during national calamities or war in certain exigency situation the constitution allows for presenting an interim budget called vote on account so subsequently at a convenient date in the latter period the full budget is presented so therefore it is a constitutional mandate to present the budget and the parliament has to discuss it and finally pass it so then you may have a question sir we anticipate something but that the revenue might not come you plan an expenditure but suddenly something may happen so your expenditure commitments will go away assuming that there is a huge cyclone there is a massive loss of property and destruction the government has to spend money more than it anticipated because it did not anticipate a disaster so the constitutional provision is that if there is a change in the budgetary things then supplementary demands should be presented to the parliament and the parliament will approve those supplementary demands so therefore budget is always for the next financial year when the budget is presented on february 1st they are estimate for the next financial year they call the be budget estimates so budget estimates for 2023-24 so now we are in a financial year called 2022-23 so we are at the fag end still there are nearly 2 months to go so last year february 2022 budget was presented so by now from april 1 2022 to by the time budget is presented january 31st 9 months of the previous the running financial year 9 months of the current financial year have also passed so what was budgeted on on in last year budget might have come true might not have come true so the government of india along with the budget estimates for the 2023-24 presents to the parliament the revised estimate for the financial year 2022-23 so the for the next year there are budget estimates for the current year it is revised estimates but still they are not final why are they not final because still february is there march is there so when the budget is presented on february 1 the data may perhaps be till december end so the still 3 months of this financial year remains there may be changes in the revenue and expenditure so the actuals will only come from the previous year so that's called 2021 22 so for the benefit of students when the budget estimates are presented for the next financial year the revised estimates are presented for this current financial year and actuals or final estimate or final accounts are presented for the previous financial year but there is only a debate on the budget estimates because the revised estimates and actuals have already have already been presented so therefore you have the three set of figures when you read the budget a the budget estimate for 2023-24 b revised estimate for 2022-23 and actual for the year 2021-22 a day before the union budget economic survey is presented 
Economic survey is essentially like a diagnosis. Budget is like a prescription. If you go to a doctor with some complaint, well, doctor will order for some blood test, x-ray, etc. Based on the report of the diagnostic test, doctor will diagnose the ailment and give you the prescription. So, economic survey is like an economic diagnosis. What is happening to the country's economy? What are the challenges? What are the new ideas that are being floated? So, a year before economic survey is presented and the budget is presented in the subsequent, on the subsequent day. So, you have to read economic survey and the budget together to understand the diagnosis and prescription. So, I gave you the introduction to the basic concept of budgeting. Now, let me get into the budget for 2023-24. So, this budget is of around 45 lakh crore. Well, what should the budget, what, what, uh, what should we do with this 45 lakh crore? So, normally there is a comparison with the previous year. So, did the budget increase for, uh, compared to the previous year? Did the budget decrease compared to the previous year? Normally, no budget will come down because the economy grows by no fault of your own also economy grows. Unless there is lockdown or pandemic or some such thing, normally economy will not come down. Very rarely economy comes down. So, we call that as recession. So, as the economy grows, government revenues increase. So, are the demands of the people, requirements of the people. So, therefore, normally budget continues to expand, at least incrementally. So, this year's budget is around 7% higher than the last year's outlay. You may call it outlay, you may call it allocation, you may call it expenditure. You may call it budget. You may name by anything. So, if you last year what was spent, compared to last year, this year budget is around 7% higher. So, is it very high? Certainly not. Because out of this expenditure, the largest component, many may not know, the largest component of expenditure, the largest item of expenditure of the government of India is not agriculture, is not education, is not health, is not public services. It is interest on the loans the government of India has taken. So, if you exclude interest, then the actual increase in the budget outlay for the financial year 2023-24, as compared to the previous year, is only 5.4%. Still, you may say it is high. But it won't be high if you factor in inflation. So, there is a concept in economics called nominal and real. What do you mean by real? Suppose I have 100 rupees last year. I have 105 rupees this year. In nominal term, there is increase of 5 rupees. But the prices have also increased. The goods and services which I can get with 100 rupees last year, I will not get it with 100 rupees this year because the prices have increased. So you have, this is the, the rise in prices is called inflation. So, if you factor in inflation, inflation is around 6 to 7 percent, even 8 percent. Inflation in food items is much higher. I am not getting into the too many details of it. But if you factor in what was 100 rupees last year, is similar to 107 rupees this year. Because when you factor in inflation. So, therefore, the budget outlay of 45 lakh crore which is 7% higher than the previous year. And if we exclude interest payment that do not really contribute anything to public welfare, it is only 5.4%. If you 
factor in inflation which is certainly higher than the 5.4 actually there is no increase in the public expenditure this financial year it is actually reduced so in real term the budget size has compressed the so budget size has been compressed so the finance minister will have a very little room to give very big boost to the allocations because the overall budget has not increased why was the overall budget not increase well the problem here is how do you increase the budget you have to tax the people so the if you tax the people then there will be political reaction you can tax the rich but the governments lack political commitment to tax the rich there is a report by an international agency called oxfam what did oxfam say if you impose a tax of 0.5% on the increased value of assets of adani between 2017 to 21 that this is a period the value of his assets has increased like anything until the recent indenberg research you might have read in his papers indenberg in a firm a research firm from united states has indicted adani of serious corporate fraud and its share value has fallen dramatically other than that there was a massive increase in the value of adani company's assets so if we impose a 0.5% tax on the increased value of assets of adani you will get the money sufficient to pay salaries for 50 lakh teachers per year but the government should have the political commitment to tax the rich tax the wealthy unfortunately in our country governments not just this government governments in the past had lacked the political uh, commitment courage to tax the wealthy tax the affluent and spend that money for the sake of the common man well it is not just the lack of courage it is also lack economic philosophy there are two schools of economic philosophy one school of economic philosophy says tax the rich tax the wealthy tax the affluent get that money spend for the people there is another school of economics which says if you tax the rich rich will not have the incentive to produce when the rich doesn't produce economy will not grow so don't interfere in those who are earning the government should not restrain or constrain those who are earning the government should facilitate them to earn more when they earn more they invest more when they invest more they produce more and there it creates employment so these are two schools of thought internationally the economic philosophy of adam smith and economic philosophy of keynes are contradictory to each other to be specific leaders like reagan thatcher have proposed that the government should not tax people but keynesian economic says you spend money put money in the hands of the people that will trigger economic growth so i'm not getting into the economic theories your teachers will teach you but the point here is this union budget lacks the keynesian thought or the economic idealism idea of taxing the rich taxing the affluent to get more to garner more resources to spend for the common man as a result the budget size did not expand so when you have the same budget size more or less what should you do if we increase somewhere there will be decrease somewhere because the cake remains the same if you give more cake to someone you have to give less cake to the other this is precisely what has happened in this budget so then then the question comes is how do you spend this money 
there are again two schools of thought do you spend money to incentivize consumption or do you spend money to incentivize production it's called demand side economics and supply side economics well i i am a votary of demand side economics somebody may believe in supply side economics also what does it it mean what is the difference so there is a school of thought that if you incentivize the producer by providing more incentives by creating the right ecosystem for the investors to invest and produce then they will invest and economy grows this is called supply side economics there is a demand side economics which says which people like us believe in you put money in the hands of the people you enhance the incomes of the people when people buy goods and services there is a demand for production and there will be more production if there is more production there will be employment if there is an employment people will have incomes when people have in people have income they spend more on goods and services when they spend more there will be more demand this is called the virtual cycle of economics consumption creates demand demand boosts production production generates employment employment creates income income results in expenditure that's consumption and consumption again creates the demand so this is called the virtual cycle in economics if it breaks it is called the vicious cycle the virtual cycle and the vicious cycle so this budget as voted for the supply side economics so it believed in a concept called you incentivize the investor an investor will produce so what did, what did it do how should you incentivize the private investment the private investor is not ready to invest it is not my statement the finance minister addressing the confederation of indian industry said it, it, she asked the investors she asked the capitalist of india why are you not investing when i am giving so much concessions to you why are you not investing because the supply side economics suffer from myopic economic thinking so it assumes that the producer and investor will continue to invest and produce so that is the basic flaw according to me in supply side economics so when the private investment despite incentives it is not forthcoming because in 2022 sorry in september 2019 the corporate income tax was reduced from 32% to 22% there is a massive decrease in 10% in corporate income tax corporate income tax is a tax levied on the incomes of big companies it has been reduced by 10 percentage points as a result according to the parliamentary standing committee report the government lost an income of 184000 crores but this the government argument was that this 184000 crore incentive will benefit the corporates to invest but corporates did not invest what did they do with this incentive they cleaned up their balance sheets they paid back their debts they have re, they have changed their high, high debt high interest debt with low interest debt ultimately they did not invest that made finance minister to get angry also so the finance minister this budget thought how do we in, how do we kick start private investment so i have given 184000 crores in 2019 corporate income tax has been reduced to low level of 22% in the united states it is 25% in japan it is 30% actually the what the corporates pay is much less i pay an income tax of 30% mukesh ambani the richest indian pays only 3% i 
I am not joking. You can type in Google effective tax rate paid by Reliance Industries of Mukesh Ambani. By using various kinds of tax concessions, he actually pays around 3%. So still, uh, the, uh, the income tax rate is at least 22%. So this time, the finance minister invented a new technique. To, they use the word crowd in. Crowd in private investment, which means to get more private investment, I will create infrastructure. So what is infrastructure? Roads, ports, air railways, airports, power, oil and gas pipelines, all this constitute infrastructure. So the finance ministers now said, I will increase the capital expenditure to create infrastructure. I will create infrastructure through public investment so that the private investment will piggy ride, will crowd in. So now 10 lakh crore out of this 45 lakh crore is allocated for capital expenditure. So this capital expenditure is aimed at increasing the airports in India, improving the rail infrastructure, around 2 lakh 40 thousand crores have been given to the railways. It will expand the highways. So this is the 10 lakh crore. It is a massive increase. Last year, the budgeted expenditure for capital expenditure in the last budget was 7.5 lakh crores. What was spent was 7.28 lakh crore, according to the revised estimates. Now it is increased to 10 lakh crore. There is a massive 25 percent, there is a massive increase of around 33 percent. So today, in 2014, the capital expenditure accounted for 12 percent of the total expenditure. It increased to 19 percent last budget. Now it is around 22 percent. If you take out 10 lakh crore out of 45 lakh crore, you can calculate it's around 22-23%. So this is a massive jump in capital expenditure. Now the finance minister believes, this government believes, that this capital expenditure will create better infrastructure. Using the better infrastructure, private sector will invest and that investment will trigger economic growth and employment. Well, I am not opposed to increasing capital expenditure. Certainly, we need infrastructure. But the problem here is, one, the government has allocated 7.5 lakh crores last year, but that money also could not be spent totally. And it was the actual expenditure, the, the revised expenditure was only 7.28 lakh crore. So when the money, when 7.5 lakh crore was not even utilized fully, will it make any difference if we increase another it, uh, by increase it by another 2.5 lakh crore. Well, we hope that this 10 lakh capital expenditure will be completely spent. Then this capital expenditure, the problem with the capital expenditure is, it won't create employment immediately. It has a long gestation period. If you start constructing a road or a rail or an air project, it doesn't get completed soon. So the, how much of this capital expenditure really goes into the hands of the people? There's a huge technology you use. There's a lot of import component in this capital expenditure. I really doubt how much will it translate into incomes in the hands of the people. Though I do not question the importance of the capital expenditure to create infrastructural assets. So when... 2.5 lakh crore additional resources are spent on infrastructure. Automatically, I told at the beginning that the budget size has not been increased. When the total budget did not increase much, it is hardly 7%. Obviously, when there is a 33% increase in the capital expenditure, there should be reduction somewhere. So what did the government do in this union budget? There is a massive reduction in many areas that immediately are of concern for the common man. For example, the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. According to Ajim Premji University Research, 
Eighty percent of the income during the lockdowns for rural households was through the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Program. Last year, eighty-nine thousand crores were spent. This year, only sixty thousand crores are allocated. A whopping reduction of thirty thirty-one percent. Food subsidies. Last year, two lakh eighty-seven thousand crores were spent. This year only one lakh ninety thousand crores are given. There is a reduction of ninety thousand crores. Massive reduction in food subsidies, fertilizer subsidies. There is a reduction of around fifty thousand crores. Petroleum subsidies. There is a reduction of around six thousand eight hundred crores. Interestingly, even rural development expenditure has also come down. When rural economy is still in crisis, last year two point two lakh forty three thousand crores were spent. This year budget allocated only two lakh thirty eight thousand crores. Surprisingly, there was a budget cut even for midday meal scheme. You can't even tolerate this kind of reduction. So it is called PM portion. Last year twelve thousand eight hundred crores were were spent. This has now come down to eleven thousand two hundred crores, eleven thousand six hundred crores. So there is a reduction of twelve hundred crores for midday meal scheme. You can't even say that this two number of children have come down. But surprisingly, the midday meal scheme allocation has also slashed by around twelve hundred crores. Allocation for agriculture has come down. Even in health sector. the pandemic has brought the importance to the public health there was what was budgeted last year was not spent there was a gap between gap of gap to the tune of 9200 crore in the budgeted and revised which means over 9000 crores of what was allocated for health last year was not spent by the end of the year well this time they have again increased but i am not sure whether that much that money will be spent given the last year's experience and also there is a concept called gender budgeting so uh, this gender budget essentially mean how much money is spent for women in this budget any government scheme which has a 30% component that benefits women is included in gender budget the gender budget is only 9% when women constitute nearly half of the population the scheduled caste constitutes 16% of the population but the scs got only 3.5% of the unit budget scheduled tribes constitute 8.6% of india's population but their share in the budget is an abysmal 2.7% so i can quote you number of such figures where there is a drastic reduction in what is spent on agriculture rural development food say food security fertilizers which is directly related to rural economy well i am not telling that the budget has nothing for agriculture where there is a digitization of public infrastructure for agriculture there are new schemes like mangrove initiative for shoreline tangible income called misti there are always schemes in every budget i am only talking about the centrality of the budget well i am not telling that there is nothing in this budget which is good which is good well for example there is a massive 66% increase for pm awas yojana which is certainly a very good decision so 66% increase for housing for poor really matters then comes the interesting part of the income tax relief well many middle class salaried your teachers always look at income tax in the budget well many think that there is a relief for income tax pays well there is a change i don't know how much it amounts for relief because in income tax there are two regimes two methods to compute income tax one is the old regime where investment on certain social security schemes like lic like housing loan get some tax relief 
that's called the old regime you might have read in the newspapers there is a new regime where no exemptions and no tax relief can be claimed so the 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 present union budget has something to for new scheme only if you do not claim exemptions on lic or housing loan on anything then if you have an income of less than 7 lakhs well you will not be taxed well i am not getting details into the income tax provisions and all that but it ultimately means not much because low earners will always have these investment like lic like housing loan and and this encouragement to the new scheme that do not offer any tax exemption tax relief on a tax exemptions will reduce the invest saving rate will reduce the social security expenditure for the common man well today at least the common the low low income population is encouraged to take an lic policy take an housing loan invest in the provident fund so that they get some tax relief and this will be useful for some social security well the finance minister in a speech said adults should be allowed to decide whether they want to save or they want to spend well that economists assume human adult human beings to be rational but reality they, they are not rational always many adult human beings have an irrational fiscal behavior so therefore our people like us are seriously skeptical of this new tax regime but at least some thing is offered i am not denying that but um, but surprisingly enough people who have income of more than 5 crores per year that means 40 la 43 lakh 42 lakh per month 42 lakh per month this budget offers incentive for them the income tax has been reduced the surcharge has been reduced i don't really understand the logic behind providing relief to those who have an annual annual income of over 5 crore do they really require they are called ultra high net worth indians in economics if you give relief to the common man the to conclude let me give a small example assuming that you are office boy in your college or a security guard in your college who gets perhaps 15 20000 10000 per month gets a relief of 5000 he will not keep this 5000 in his bank he will not buy gold with this 5000 he will not buy a re- but what will he do he will buy more oil he will buy more milk he will make his children to eat egg a day well this will ultimately create demand in the economy called consumption but if you give relief to those who have 5 crore income what will they do they will use it in an unproductive way but surprisingly our finance ministers believe that providing relief to the rich will give the philip to the economy i well, i don't believe in that economic school i believe in an economic school when you put money in the hands of ordinary indians ordinary indians script the growth story of india if under there are 140 crore indians if every indian drinks a two glasses of milk a day what will be the demand for dairy products if 100 out of 140 crore if 100 crore eat an egg a day you require 100 crore x a day you require 36500 crore x to be produced in india how much will be the boost for the poultry industry so therefore i firmly believe that the consumption of indians boosts the economy especially at a time the world may slip into recession and when world slips into recession it is extremely difficult to export so our own domestic consumption should provide the trigger to the economy but the budget unfortunately believes 
in a philosophy contrary to this well this is subject to debate i have, i can only give my opinion others may have a completely different opinion so democracy has a room for all kinds of opinions so i have placed my opinions before you it is up to you to think reflect and formulate your own opinion so i try to make the budget as simple as possible but still it is in economics so it's in economics is a precision science so it is not always possible to oversimplify the concepts in economics so but i profusely thank the department of economics for giving me this opportunity to interact with you i all i all as i said it is always exciting to speak to young brains if you really have some questions i don't mind answering otherwise thank you very much for a patient here so prathi sari budget anedi takku avutunnappudu aa budget migitha budget em avutundi sir mari next time penchutunnappudu అదే బడ్జెట్ పెంచుతున్నారు కానీ స్పెండింగ్ మాత్రం టోటల్ ఎకానమీ మీద అవ్వట్లేదు అది ఏమవుతుంది వెల్ ప్రతి ఇయర్ తగ్గుతుందని నేను చెప్పలేదు ప్రతి ఇయర్ పెరుగుతుందని చెప్పాను ఈవెన్ దిస్ ఇయర్ కూడా దర్ ఇస్ సెవెన్ పర్సెంట్ ఇంక్రీజ్ అని చెప్పాను అయితే వెన్ ది ఓవరాల్ సైజ్ ఇంక్రీజెస్ మార్జినలీ అండ్ వెన్ దర్ ఇస్ ఎ మాసివ్ ఇంక్రీజ్ ఫర్ సంథింగ్ ఇట్ షుడ్ ఆటోమేటికలీ మీన్ రిడక్షన్ ఫర్ సంథింగ్ ఎల్స్ అంటే మీరు ఓవరాల్ సైజ్ పెరగకపోతే పెద్దగా ఒక రంగానికి భారీగా కేటాయిస్తే ఆటోమేటిక్గా ఒక రంగానికి తగ్గించాలి ఇట్ ద సింపుల్ మ్యాథమెటిక్స్ వెన్ ది టోటల్ డజన్ ఇంక్రీజ్ వెన్ దెర్ ఈజ్ ఏ ఇంక్రీజ్ ఇన్ సమ్వేర్ దెర్ షుడ్ బి డిక్రీజ్ ఇన్ సమ్వేర్ ఎల్స్ సో దట్ ప్రిసైజ్లీ వాట్ హస్ హ్యాపెన్ ఇన్ దిస్ యూనియన్ బడ్జెట్ మీరు అడిగినట్టు ఎక్కడికి పోతుంది అంటే ఒక రంగానికి తగ్గిస్తే ఇంకో రంగానికి వెళ్తుంది ఫర్ ఎగ్జాంపుల్ అప్పుడు హై ఎక్కడికి పోయింది హై నెట్ వర్త్ ఇండియన్స్ వాళ్ళ ట్యాక్స్ రిలీఫ్ వచ్చింది మిడిల్ క్లాస్ ఇండియన్స్ గాట్ ఎ లిటిల్ బిట్ ఆఫ్ ట్యాక్స్ రిలీఫ్ సో దెర్ ఇస్ ఎ అదర్ ఇన్సెంటివ్స్ కార్పొరేట్ ఇన్కమ్ ట్యాక్స్ హ్యాస్ బిన్ రెడ్యూస్ సో దే గాట్ వన్ ల్యాక్ ఎయిటీ ఫోర్ థౌజండ్ క్రోర్స్ ఎక్కడికోళ్ళు వచ్చింది ఈ మనీ గవర్నమెంట్ కలెక్టెడ్ టూ ల్యాక్ ఫార్టీ థౌజండ్ క్రోర్స్ ఆన్ ఇన్ ద ఫార్మ్ ఆఫ్ ట్యాక్సెస్ అండ్ పెట్రోలియం ప్రొడక్ట్స్ so they collected 240000 crores from people and given 184000 crores for the big corporates so there is somewhere it has to be adjusted so money doesn't go anywhere money where it goes as the as a result what is happening there is humongous inequalities in india totally the latest oxfam report says 1% of indians own 40% of the wealth 1% Indians own 40% of total wealth in India. Whereas the bottom 50% earn, uh, have only 3% of the total wealth in India. So this is the humongous inequalities. And the Desha Sampadalo, Nalabai Shatham, Okka Shatham, Janabal Chetul lo undi. Desha Sampadalo, Kevala Moodu Shatham, Yabai Shatham, Bharati Le Chetul lo, Kevala Moodu Shatham me undi. so i'll give you another example there are around 23 crore indians with a daily income of less than rupee 375 prathi roju 370 rupayala kanna takkuva adayam unna vallu 23 crore mandi unnaru the daily income of gautam adani is 1600 crores 1600 crore line adayam so there is humongous inequalities your question is very appropriate when the budget reduces money for the common man and provides incentives for the rich and the big business what will happen is there will be massive widening of inequalities there's a rise in inequality that is precisely what is happening in india today that the political economy of india's budgets is essentially the rich trying to amass more wealth at the cost of the common average indian that is the, the figures which i have given is an ample testimony for the kind of appropriation a wealth and income that are accruing in india so my question is what is the suitable mechanism we can see in the present uh, present budget to reduce physical deficit 
I really doubt because it is not physical deficit, it is fiscal deficit. So let me, let me correct you, don't worry, don't worry, fine, you have asked. Well, what is fiscal deficit, can anybody tell? Well, fiscal, I don't want to test you, you may already have a lot of tests. So, fiscal deficit is the, the difference between what the government earns and what the government spends. So, the total income, in a very simplified way, the total uh, earning of the government and total expenditure. If the earning is more than the expenditure, we call it surplus. If the earning is less than, if the expenditure is more than earning, we call it deficit. Normally, we don't have fiscal surpluses. Because in a developing economy, there is no concept in keeping surplus with you. In a developing economy, generally, the, the advisable concept of economics is you spend more than what you earn also. So that the earning will income. Suppose I have 10 lakh rupees. If I borrow 10 lakh and construct a house, that is the correct strategy. Rather than wait for 20 lakhs to accumulate. By the time I accumulate 20 lakh, the house price will be 40 lakh. I will never construct my house in my lifetime. Assuming that I am a parent, my child got seat in IIT. And I have to spend 20 lakh. If I say I don't have the 20 lakh, I can't earn. So don't study. Is it responsible parenting? Instead the parents say, I will borrow 20 lakh. You study and you get the good job and then you can repay. So that's called deficit financing. So in a developing economy, a developing family, deficit financing is not unhealthy, it is healthy economics. So therefore you always have fiscal deficit. So, but to prevent government from spending recklessly with, with utter disregard for what they earn, there is an act in parliament and state assembly called the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act, FRBM. According to this FRBM, the fiscal deficit should not be more than 3% of gross domestic product. GDP refers to the total value of the goods and services produced in a country, in a given period, in one year normally. So therefore, but today, even today, the fiscal deficit the government estimates, hopes to achieve, it reduce it to 5.8, 5.9%, much above the FRBM limits. So how to reduce the fiscal deficit? Well, there are, uh, you, if you earn more, the fiscal deficit comes down. Or you spend less, the fiscal deficit comes down. Suppose I have income of 20,000 and I have an expenditure of 25,000. My fiscal deficit is 5,000. Am I right? Yes. How will it come down? If I spend, if I earn 25,000, it will come to zero. Or if I reduce my expenditure to 20,000, 20, also it will come down to zero. Either I should earn more or spend less. The Good economics says, the conservative economics says, you reduce expenditure. But reducing expenditure will reduce development, will reduce welfare. So the good economics says, earn more by taxing those who can, who can be taxed, that the rich people, big corporates, or earn more by investing, by improving the economy. If economy grows automatically, income grows. Suppose your parent has an your parents have twenty thousand income, their expenditure is twenty five thousand. I will reduce five thousand on your education. Don't go to tuition tomorrow. Don't learn that software. I won't buy your buy you a laptop. That is not a good parent. Who is a good parent? He will say, I will work for another overtime on Sundays also. I will earn more money. This is what an every Indian parent does. Am I right? They sacrifice, they earn, they earn more, they do something. So that is precisely the government should do. They should either earn more or even borrow sometimes to boost the economy. If your father continues, if your mother, mother and father continues to borrow for your education 
after 5 years 6 years when you become grown up child and you yearn and pay back you may ask a question sir if i don't yearn what will happen then your family will become fiscally bankrupt so we hope that you grow and you yearn and repay the debts and get that money back so that is how all our parents do that is how my parents did my my i am a son of an ordinary school teacher and i came for intermediate to hyderabad and at that time my pay my parents used my father used to send rupees 300 per month so his income was not sufficient so he used to take tuitions in the evening earn more and spend because of the sacrifice of my parents today what i am here so i owe my gratitude to my parents every day if they did not do this, I wouldn't have become a professor. How well, I would have become something else. That's a different story. So, that, so ultimately, the government should earn more money by taxing people who can spend, by improving, by taxing people who can, who can be taxed, or by increasing, the, by expanding the economy and reduce wasteful expenditure, reduce the expenditure which doesn't require. Assuming that your parents are spending 5,000, 2,000 rupees on cigarettes, your father is spending. Well, good father says, uh, Betty, I'll get you a laptop, I'll stop smoking from tomorrow. Well, that is the great father then. So, if the father says, I'll sell you a laptop and get more cigarettes, he's a bad father. So, what will he do? So, he will cut down somewhere to ensure Cutting down expenditure on cigarettes is good for. Well, I don't use a uh, 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 scooter from tomorrow so that I will save on petrol. I will take an RTC bus and go. So that is how the saving has to be done. So ultimately, you earn more or spend less. You can spend less by cutting down on wasteful expenditure so that the fiscal deficit will not hurt the growth of the country. Good afternoon everyone, the respected sir and principal ma'am. Myself, Savapa Fatima, I am pursuing BCom second year. My question is, as we all pay the taxes, citizens of India, so what is the, how much it affects the budgets of India every year? Thank you. GST, good. So, she is right. So, every citizen pays tax. Unfortunately, when we say taxpayer, you get a feeling that only income taxpayer is the taxpayer. It's not true. If you go to a hotel and eat something there in a restaurant, if there is a GST, assuming that the hotel owner pays that GST, the tax, if you buy a soap, it is tax. So GST, there are taxes, uh, well, come to the government. Well, there are taxes are of two kinds. One, direct taxes to indirect taxes. What is the difference? If government imposes a tax on you, you only pay, it is called direct tax. Government taxes income tax. Income tax is on my income. I can't transfer it to someone else. Indirect taxes are taxes where I don't pay but I collect and pay. Like GST, like excise duty. Income tax is like, uh, the direct taxes are like income tax, like corporate tax. Well, we don't have a wealth tax, inheritance tax. If we have that indirect tax, GST, excise duties. Well, the, the GST includes excise duties, but alcohol and fuel were excluded. So we still have excise duties on them. So excise duties, all these are indirect taxes. Normally, who pay the direct taxes? Those who are wealthy, those who have incomes, pay direct taxes. Who pays indirect taxes? Ordinary Indians. A laborer who buys a soap pays a, a GST. But he doesn't pay income tax. So therefore, the good taxation is you have less indirect taxation and more direct taxation. If you look at the OECD countries, OECD countries mean Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, which is a club of rich countries, 66% is direct taxes, 33% are indirect taxes. So the rich 
pay 66%. The ordinary citizens pay 33%. But in our country, it is reverse. So the 53% are indirect taxes. So indirect taxes have been increasing day by day, whereas the direct taxes have been reduced. As I told you, even in this budget, people who have income of over 5 crores were given tax relief. So no tax relief on GST, but tax relief on those who have income of over 5 crores. So the one of the negative features of our taxation is, in our country, the more indirect taxes which ordinary Indians pay, and less direct taxes with India's rich and super rich pay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, sir. Actually, um, food me the oil me the prices perugutone on night every year that we know. But last four years back, oil price was a liter 70 rupees. But now it's 170 rupees. Why the drastic change of 100 rupees? Like, okay, resources are not enough. Max 50 is more than enough. But 100 rupees, why the GST and everything? Why that much of increase in cost? Which oil cost 170 rupees? Unfortunately, I don't buy anything in my house. My wife takes care. So I really don't know the prices. Which oil are you referring to? No, no, which oil? Freedom oil. Okay. Well, you're right. Why does the prices of commodities increase? So it's a very interesting question. So why does the prices of commodities increase? According to school, uh, traditional conventional economics, the prices are determined by demand and supply. If there is a more demand, the prices will increase. If you go to Samakka, Saraka, Jatra, the prices will be very high there. Because there is a huge demand there. So, or if supply comes down, if there is a less production, the prices will increase. But this is only textbook economics. What is in reality, there are many factors. So, there are many factors that contribute to higher prices. I really don't know why the freedom oil has increased. But I can tell you why the prices increase. Number one, cost to push inflation. So if the cost of production increases, automatically the prices will increase. For example, in this budget, fertilizer prices have been reduced by 50,000 crores. What does it mean? The fertilizer prices will increase. When fertilizer prices increase, cost of production of oil seeds increase. When cost of production of oil seeds increase, Oil price increase. It is called the cost push inflation. Then there is a demand pull inflation. If there are more consumption of any particular item, the prices will increase. Number two. Number three, taxes. Sometimes, there, uh, for example, the uh, globe, uh, there is a, a global supply chain, chains will be disrupted. For example, there is a Russia-Ukraine war. Ukraine accounts for most part of the sunflower production in the world. As a result, sunflower oil increase. Indonesia accounts for uh, palm oil supplies. So when Indo Indonesia imp imposes restrictions on export of palm oil, palm oil prices increase. And there is also the traders Jimmy here. Sometimes traders create artificial scarcity and Reduce supplies in the market to increase prices. So you are right, prices should not abnormally increase. But black marketing, hoarding, profiteering, taxing, demand supply fluctuations, cost, uh, cost of production and a whole lot of factors contribute to the rise in prices. My suggestion to the children here is, economics is, a, is like common sense. Your mother is, is the best economist in the country. So she knows the economics. So the point here is, so what is economics? So Ivala Enti Anadite fried rice, Anna Vantaman Arthan just call Madhyana Anna Migli Untali. Madhyana Anna Migilte Sayantra fried rice. Curd Miglin than Kondi, next day I met the curd chutney. 
so the mother knows how to optimally use the resources anni e kur e vegetable sariga led ankondi yalle enta maata mixed vegetable kadi ishta bidda antadi mixed vegetable anta evi poorthiga levu anukal anni kalpesesindi so the mother is the very big great economist so economics is common sense you don't need to i did not study economics in my lifetime you might have, after hearing me for budget for more than a hour you might be thinking that i am a student of economics certainly not i am a student of electronics i was a graduate in mathematics physics electronics that too in distinction i did not fail in electronics to talk about economics so i did my post graduation in journalism and i have done my doctorate in political science but i was a visiting professor in economics at billa institute of technology and sciences i taught international trade to indian economic services officers without studying economics in my lifetime so why if you have interest you can learn i am not a student of political science also i did my doctorate there in journalism the only time i read political science was when i taught my wife when she was writing ma political science exam so i have taught her uh, uh, so as a proud as that so except that i never lost study it so ultimately it is your passion if you have passion for learning you can learn anything you can learn constitution you can learn economics you can learn politics well it may not be so easy to learn science subjects because of the complexity involved but social science subject you can always learn if you have that kind of an interest passion so even if you are not a student of economics you can still acquire economics if you are a student of economics read politics read sociology read history read science and technology because this is the world that respects interdisciplinary knowledge unfortunately our education system has in silos we remain in silos we remain in silos you will be surprised you have invited this college invited me to deliver a lecture on a subject of economics but i teach in arts college my own department of economics has never invited me in the, in, in, in last 40 years the last 40 years they have never invited me to talk on economics so a few weeks back they have asked me for some seminar that was the first time which i could not go so the reason why i am telling is we have an education system which is compartmentalized don't have these barriers education and knowledge is interdisciplinary we'll try have a command get a command in economics but read other subjects also so that your and knowledge of economics will also get enriched poor people vaalle evaraithe effort cheyalekunnaro oil prices gaani food prices gaani vegetable prices edaithe effort cheyalekunnaro vaalla kosam ani government subsidies provide cheyochu kada ante like ration shops kaakunda normal gaane for people an jappi koncham denlo naina reduction chesi బడ్జెట్ రిడక్షన్ చేసుకు దీనిలో బడ్జెట్ పెంచి వీళ్ళకి కొంచెం తగ్గించి ఇవ్వచ్చు కదా అలా ఎలాంటి ఆప్షన్స్ లేవా ఎందుకు లేవు వాళ్ళు చేయడం లేదు కారణం ఏంటంటే మనం అడగడం లేదు మనం వాళ్ళు చేసినా చేయకపోయినా ఓటేజ్ గెలిపిస్తున్నాం ఓటేసే సమయానికి డబ్బులు తీసుకొని మందుబాటులు తీసుకొని మతం పేరిట కులం పేరిట లేదా చైనా పేరిట పాకిస్తాన్ పేరిట ఓట్లేస్తున్నాం సో లేకుంటే పఠాన్ సినిమా మనకన్నీ ఇదే కదా చర్చ ఇప్పుడు ఆయిల్ ప్రైస్ తగ్గిందా లేదా వంట నూనె ధర తగ్గిందా లేదా అనేది మనకు చర్చే కాదు మనకు చర్చ షారూఖ్ ఖాన్ పఠాన్ మన పంచాయతీలు అన్నీ వేరు కదా సో అందుకే మనం ఇట్లున్నాం మనం మీరు అన్నట్లు తప్పనిసరిగా తగ్గించాలి ఎందుకంటే ఎకనామిక్స్లో కూడా ఇన్ఫ్లేషన్ ఎస్పెషల్లీ ఫుడ్ ఇన్ఫ్లేషన్ హర్ట్స్ ద కామన్ మ్యాన్ మోర్ దెన్ అదర్స్ సపోజ్ వాట్ ఐ స్పెండ్ ఆన్ ఫుడ్ is a very minuscule of my income i am a professor my income how much i spend out of this to on food is negligible but the poor spend substantial part of their income on food according to the national uh, con- uh, sample survey organizations consumption surveys f- poor ac- food account for 60% of the poor man's income unfortunately the inflation doesn't bite everybody equally inflation bites the common man more eppudu kuda darala peragudalla samanyanni pedavani ekko baadistundi 
డబ్బున్నవాడిని ఎక్కువ బాధించదు ఎందుకు బాధించదు అంటే డబ్బున్నవాడు తన ఆహారం పైన ఇతర వస్తువుల పైన చేసే ఖర్చు చాలా తక్కువ కంపేర్డ్ టు ద అదర్స్ సో అందువల్ల నాకు మాకేం కాదు అందువల్ల ఖచ్చితంగా ప్రభుత్వం ఇన్వాల్వ్ కావాలి ధరలు నియంత్రించాలి సో ధరలు తగ్గించడానికి అనేక రకాల చర్యలు తీసుకోవాలి అన్ఫార్చునేట్లీ ఇన్ దిస్ బడ్జెట్ యు డోంట్ ఫైండ్ ఎనీ బిగ్ మెజర్ టు రెడ్యూస్ ఇన్ఫ్లేషన్ దర్ ఇస్ ఎనదర్ డ్రాబ్యాక్ ఆఫ్ దిస్ బడ్జెట్ దెర్ ఇస్ మెన్షన్ దెర్ ఇస్ నాట్ ఎనీ సౌండ్ స్ట్రాటజీ టు రెడ్యూస్ ద ప్రైసెస్ యు షుడ్ ఇన్ ఫ్యాక్ట్ ఐ ఆమ్ నాట్ టెలింగ్ ద గవర్నమెంట్ ఈజ్ నాట్ డూయింగ్ ఎనీథింగ్ ప్రభుత్వం ఏమీ చేయడం లేదు అనడం లేదు బట్ నాట్ ఇన్ ఎట్ నాట్ అడిక్వేట్లీ డూయింగ్ ఇట్ నాట్ అడిక్వేట్లీ డూయింగ్ ఇట్ అండ్ ప్రిసైజ్లీ బికాస్ ఇట్ లెట్ ది గవర్నమెంట్ షుడ్ హ్యావ్ ద విజన్ టు రెడ్యూస్ ద ప్రైసెస్ ఇట్ ఈస్ నాట్ ఇంపాసిబుల్ ఖచ్చితంగా చేయొచ్చు ఏదో ఒక సందర్భంలో మన చేతిలో ఉండదు అప్పుడు పెట్రోల్ డీజిల్ ఉంది ఎయిటీ పర్సెంట్ ఎయిటీ ఫైవ్ పర్సెంట్ మనం ఇంపోర్ట్ చేసుకోవాలి కానీ ధరలు మనము ప్ర ఇంపోర్ట్ చేసుకోవడం వల్ల పెరగడుతుందా నిజం కాదు ఎవరు టూ థౌజండ్ ట్వెల్వ్ థర్టీన్ ఆ ప్రాంతంలో ప్రపంచ చమురు మార్కెట్లో ముడి చమురు ధర హండ్రెడ్ అండ్ ఫార్టీ డాలర్స్ పర్ బ్యారెల్ ఉండే అప్పుడు సెవెంటీ రూపీస్ ఉండే పెట్రోల్ ధర ఇప్పుడు ఈవెన్ టుడే ఎయిటీ ఎయిటీ ఫైవ్ డాలర్స్ పర్ బ్యారెల్ ఉంది కానీ ఇప్పుడు హండ్రెడ్ రూపీస్ పైన ఉంది ఎందుకుంది కారణం ఏంటంటే ట్యాక్సెస్ అప్పుడు డీజిల్ పైన త్రీ రూపీ ఫిఫ్టీ సిక్స్ పైసా ట్యాక్స్ ఉంటే ఇప్పుడు ఇది థర్టీ వన్ రూపీస్ ఉండి మొన్న తగ్గిస్తే ట్వంటీ వన్ రూపీస్ ఉంది ఇప్పటికీ కూడా పెట్రోల్ పైన నైన్ రూపీ ఫార్టీ ఎయిట్ పైసా ట్యాక్స్ ఉంటే సెంట్రల్ గవర్నమెంట్ ట్యాక్స్ ఇన్ ట్వంటీ ఫోర్టీన్ ఇప్పుడు అది థర్టీ టూ రూపీస్ అయి మొన్న తగ్గిస్తే కొంత తగ్గింది బట్ స్టిల్ ఇట్ ఈస్ ఫార్ మచ్ హై కంపేర్డ్ టు వాట్ వాజ్ దేర్ ఇన్ ట్వంటీ ఫోర్టీన్ సో దెర్ ఆర్ సెవరల్ వేస్ ద గవర్నమెంట్ బై రెడ్యూసింగ్ ట్యాక్సెస్ బై ఇన్సెంటివైజింగ్ ప్రొడక్షన్ by augmenting supplies, by controlling the input production cost. There are many ways to control inflation. But unfortunately, it's not given a serious debate. We don't find parliament and legislature discussing seriously on price rise. If they discuss seriously, newspapers and TV channels don't cover. As I, I, in my, when I became a member of the Legislative Council in 2007, as fortunately on the second or third day i got an opportunity to speak on price rise then i spoke for half an hour in detail what should be done to reduce prices kasu when krishna reddy was the minister for civil supplies he came from the minister's benches to my to meet me and congratulate me sir you have spoken very well i will invite you for a cup of tea let's discuss next day morning not a single newspaper covered it though all those journalists are my good friends suppose nenu oka potlakaya nettle medal esconi or rendu sevarakayalu meeda vetkonu gadal laaga tomato la dande esconi assembly ku council ku voyunte guarantee ga page 1 lo photo vacchedi that is how the media also bothers so there are several factors why price rise is not on the public policy agenda but it should be mera natlu kachithanga undali thank you sir thank you very much sir for uh, answering every question patiently